Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on what is our first ever live social media interview. My name is Carolyn Wilson, and I'm a project engineer at Rolls-Royce, and it's my pleasure today to be joined by our CEO, Warren East, to talk about our roadmap to net zero. Hi, Warren. Hi, Caroline. So let's kick things off straight mm -hmm. away, and we will start by asking, what is net zero, and what is it that we're here today to launch? Okay, so um, our Rolls-Royce business is about taking stored energy, turning it into useful power. We're well known for um, engines on aeroplanes, but actually we work across the whole range of transport, energy and, and, and the built environment. Um, however, a lot of that business is, is all about our customers essentially burning fossil fuels in, uh, in the products that we create. And uh, that's clearly, you know, was a good idea uh, in the 20th century. Uh, it's not a good idea in the 21st century. And um, we have to make sure that we change and, uh, and move to uh, a situation where we're, we're not um, adding carbon dioxide to the environment. So a year ago, we joined the UN Race to Zero. And um, that's a fantastic ambition. Uh, to achieve net zero by 2050. But today, we're launching the plan that explains exactly how we get there. Okay, thank you. So it's been a really difficult year for the company and it's interesting mm. you say we've, we've started having these conversations and signing up last year. So mm. why is it that we're starting to publicly talk about this now? Well, uh, that, that's a good question, and it, you're absolutely right, of course. Um, the, uh, the whole COVID-19 situation has been um, you know, very tough for, for our business. And indeed, you know, lots of businesses, and in particular businesses associated with, uh, with things like air travel. But um, you know, we've been working on uh, decarbonizing our products and, and the use of our products by our customers for some time. And uh, you know, the, 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 the change in the world whereby um, society has to move to a, a, a net zero um, way of working in order to, um, in, in order to ensure that we as, as human beings um, you know, continue to look after our planet. Um, that hasn't changed just because COVID came along. Uh, and so we've had to, had to absolutely keep going uh, on this. And now is the time to start talking about what we're doing. So you mentioned earlier fossil fuels, and obviously so much of what we produce relies on fossil fuels at, mm. it, at its core. Um, how are we going to go about changing that in the future? Well, um, we, we, we can break this down into sort of three buckets, really. Uh, there's there's um, carbon emissions that we create in going about our business. And uh, there's carbon emissions that are created as, as a result of you know, everybody um, using our, our products and, um, and, and, and the value chain. And then, then the third area is creating a, a, an environment for our, our customers to, um, t to not do that. Um, so, the, fir the first one, easy, we can, we can talk about that. The second one, this is, this is the challenge, um, making sure that our products are compatible with net zero or net zero. Uh, and that relies on you know, the innovation of uh, our people, um, which is a key differentiator uh, for Rolls-Royce and um, you know, bringing all the technologies that we have uh, to bear to help our customers uh, get there. So you've mentioned our people as a key differentiator. Mm. Um, what might the life for our people in operational facilities and sites around the world look like as we go about trying to cut our emissions in our own facilities? I think people in Rolls-Royce are gonna notice change. They, they should already be noticing, uh, noticing change um, in our facilities. Now this is a very small part of our overall carbon emissions is, is, is what we create in our facilities. It's less than half a percent. However, it's something that we have absolute control over. And so, um, you know, we can do things like ensure that the power that we use in our plants is carbon free. So we can practice what we preach, install our own microgrids in, uh, in, in sites, for instance. Um, employees will see solar panels uh, and, and the like, 
providing the carbon-free power for, uh, for those microgrids. Um, people will see uh, in the consumption of products that we use to go about our operations, um, you know, new measures to find new ways of, of doing things so, so that we uh, consume less. These are the sorts of changes. And then, of course, people will also see changes in our product portfolio. It's really interesting, actually, that you say that our own facilities internally are such a small percentage of the carbon as a whole. So I think it's important to understand how we work with our customers to reduce emissions and the carbon footprint across the sectors in which we operate as a whole. Mm. And, and, and this is the big one. Um, so first of all, we have to make sure that our products themselves, um, and particularly you know, our new products, are compatible with net zero operations. So we've pledged to make sure that our new products are all going to be compatible with net zero operation by 2030. Uh, and as old products come out of use, that means that by 2050, all our products will be uh, compatible with net zero. Um, and that involves um, you know, a certain amount of, uh, certain amount of um, innovation and, and new technology and things like uh, electric flight, for instance, would be a good example of, of getting into new areas. Um, but it also means adapting some of the products that we have to be compatible with things like, a, use the example in aviation, um, synthetic aviation fuel. Um, we need to make sure that our products are compatible with that. We also need to go a little bit further than just the products. Um, again, using that example, I think, uh, I think we have a serious role to play in influencing policy makers, um, uh, governments, trade associations and the like, so that they provide the right sort of environment to stimulate the, the uptake of things like SAFs by, uh, by our customers. So I think the civil aviation and civil aerospace part of the Rolls-Royce business is something that most people will be more familiar with. Mm. What, what about our power systems and nuclear and defence businesses? What, what changes are we likely to see or outputs are we likely to see in the net zero roadmap towards mm. changing those? So in our power systems business, you know, we're essentially doing the same thing as we are in the, in the aerospace world. We're providing our customers with a means of taking some stored energy, turning it into, into useful power. Uh, typically, the engines that we, that we have um, uh, been selling to customers there, they're, they're diesel reciprocating engines instead of gas turbines. But apart from that, then um, it's, it's doing the same thing from an environmental point of view. Um, but increasingly there, um, we're, we're really talking about systems, the clues in the wood. Uh, Rolls-Royce power systems uh, and that means not just the conversion of, of the stored energy into power but the system that you wrap around it that's increasingly becoming more more electric and uh, and then you start saying well actually we're selling a system the source of the the, uh, the power can be different and so you can do something for instance like replace the diesel engine by a fuel cell and um, so you know, we've been over the last uh, couple of years or so, we've been enhancing the portfolio in, in power systems, tilting it towards, um, towards a future world of, of net zero, working on the system aspect. So the, the microgrid, for instance, that we're installing in our, our location in Bristol is, um, is a power systems uh, microgrid. Um, and uh, you know, the components, uh, in, in that microgrid uh, such that we'll be able to power Bristol at, uh, at, at net zero by, um, by as early as next year. Um, in our defence business, uh, then it's probably a bit more similar to our, our civil business, but, um, but actually there's, a, there's, again, we provide into the defence world a range of different, uh, different products that uh, en enable our defence customers. And um, for governments that, uh, particularly our big defence customers, UK government, US government, you know, the carbon footprint of the defence operations is a significant part of governments, those governments' carbon footprint. And we can bring all the technologies uh, that we have and that we're deploying in, in the world of commercial world, uh, both in power systems and in aerospace, to bear on that defence world and help those defence customers. So on the topic of 
alternative sources and different sources of power. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're doing with small modular reactors as a business? Yeah, so, I mean, this is a really exciting area for me because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's based on our decades of experience in nuclear. Uh, and of course, this is zero carbon. Uh, and um, what we have there is a, a concept based on all that knowledge uh, to create a much smaller, um, much um, more uh, efficient in terms of, of area and importantly in terms of cost uh, way of uh, creating nuclear power. And that's a good answer for grid-based power um, uh, and not, not sort of replacing renewables but augmenting renewables and providing continuity of power in grid applications. Um, but also because these things are relatively small uh, for a nuclear power station, sort of 470 megawatts, um, then uh, you know that works for uh, standalone applications um, where we can sort of really cross boundaries. So I talked about synthetic aviation fuel. You have to get the zero carbon energy from somewhere to store it in that synthetic aviation fuel. And SMRs are a fantastic answer for that. Thank you. So uh, it is really interesting and exciting, as you say, but I think um, we've obviously got a lot of a lot of work to do to be able to make this all a reality. So who are the key people that we need to work with to make that happen? Well, I, I mean, first of all, let, let, let's start out internally. You know, we're a, a company and we talk about pioneering the power that matters. Um, we're a company stuffed full of innovative engineers. Uh, and so, you know, the people where where the ideas are actually created and the breakthroughs are made, that's uh, that's inside the company. But we don't work in isolation. This is a massive problem for the whole of society. And so we have to work within the ecosystems that are applicable for the for the customers uh, that we serve. An example like might be, for instance, um, in the world of electric aviation, where we uh, there's obviously a great business opportunity in in a in a sort of business where we we don't operate today in the, in that size of of aircraft but there's more business opportunity if you think about a regional airport where those uh, aircraft have to be have to be recharged um, then of course there's opportunities for say our power systems business um, to uh, to provide the off grid um, energy uh, that's required to, to charge those aircraft. So I think we're going to work ac across ecosystems like that. And as I mentioned before, it's very important that we play our role in influencing the policy makers as well to provide the right commercial and economic environment. So it's clear that we've got a lot a lot to do and we've got a clear pathway of how we're going to achieve that which is great mm. um, and thank you so much for taking us through that but on a personal note just to sort of wrap things up uh, I'd like to ask you what you're most excited about around the future of Rolls-Royce. So um, let me just quickly ask you while I'm thinking about that you've heard me talk now for five minutes or so about this um, what excites you? Um, I think, well, thank, thank you for asking me for my opinion. Um, I think that the most exciting thing that we've got at the minute is obviously coming out, we're coming out the back of a very difficult period in terms of the pandemic. And it's been a real challenge for everyone across all sites on Rolls Royce, mm. um, working in the defense sector, I've certainly seen and felt that as well. Um, however, it's really exciting that we're starting to see the end in sight of, of the restrictions and everything in between. But if I had to pick one of the exciting projects that I'm aware of in the pipeline, it would definitely be starting to get involved in the race to space. And that's something I would definitely like to see myself getting involved in in the very near future. Well, that sounds sounds exciting in and of itself. And um, you know, I ho hope you can do that. And actually, just listening to that is part of what excites me. Um, it What excites me is the enlarging of the scope of our activities um, but possibly more important you know this energy transition is a once in several hundred years um, event uh, for for society and um, you know so you've got to be pretty lucky to live through a transition like that which is really going to happen in a relatively short period of time but then Rolls-Royce is in such a fantastic position. We are one of the few companies with a breadth of technology and expertise that can really help address um, one of society's 
big challenges and uh, big opportunities. So to be there at the time um, for me is uh, is really exciting, and um, that's I think the, what excites me most. Well, Warren, thank you so much for taking us through all of this. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm sure if there's plenty of questions coming in, but if you've got any further questions or want to find out more about the Rolls-Royce Roadmap to Net Zero, please follow us on social media or go over to our website, 